Hello and welcome to this alumni festival tour of the Museum of Classical Archaeology. My name is Suzanne Turner and I am the curator here and we are one of nine university museums and collections that together form the University of Cambridge Museums. Yeah, it just it rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, and we are the littlest of those collections. In many ways too, we are a slightly strange collection um, because what you're looking at here are plaster casts, replicas, copies of statues from the ancient world, Greece and Rome. Um, and that makes us freaky weird, really, because basically I'm sort of telling you that I've got a collection of fakes here, aren't I? Except they're not, they're not fakes. At no point in their history have any of the objects in this gallery kind of tried to be passed off as their original. No one has ever pretended that they're anything other than a replica. Um, but it does make us a very different collection to other collections within the university, or indeed uh, museum collections more generally. If you think about how a museum collection is typically grown, um, it's through serendipity and luck what was discovered at what point in time, what um, came on the market at what point in time, what was donated and through lots of other processes. And instead, our objects, in many cases, were chosen from the pages of the catalogue by my predecessors. Our collection was built up very strategically and deliberately. So what I want to do today is think a little bit more about what it means for us to have a collection of copies. Um, and that means not only thinking about the casts, but also about the originals that they represent. Because copying and processes of replication are not restricted to the 18th and 19th centuries, or indeed um, the collection today. The, in the ancient world, copying culture was a really important part of the Roman world. And our casts have a foot in both the ancient and modern worlds. So they're kind of hybrid objects. So I want to think a little bit today about those multiple histories of replication and how they've shaped the objects that we have. What I'm standing next to here is our plaster cast of the Farnese Hercules. Um, I don't know how much of him you can see because he is actually massive. We can't quite fit both of us in, in the screen at the same time. Uh, and he's huge. Um, he's one of the earliest casts in our collection. So our collection began in the Fitzwilliam Museum in the year that it opened, in the year 1848-49, that academic year, when the Fitzwilliam Museum was gifted three plaster casts. And the next year, they were gifted a collection of 30 plaster casts, all of which came from the same house that originally stood on the banks of the Thames. And the Farnese Hercules was one of those casts. So it came from a collection of copies. Now, I don't know about you guys watching this, but he wouldn't fit in my entrance hallway. Um, so it was a very big house, and in fact, he had an entire sculpture gallery. All of the cars were displayed together in a sculpture gallery. Um, and the house no longer exists, and it's difficult for us to reconstruct it. And in fact, if you're going to attend Carrie Vout's lecture later, she might talk more about this. But in, a, in essence, these replicas um, all stood in this house, and the great and the good of the 19th century art world came to visit them. And they functioned as kind of, I guess, embodiments of the cultural capital that the classical world represented in the 18th and 19th centuries. They were more than just kind of decorative features in this house. Um, but a plaster cast is, in fact, a very different type of copy than the original Farnese Hercules was, because he too was a copy. The original stood in the baths of Caracal in Rome. Um, and it was huge because the plaster cast is the same size uh, and probably it was on quite a tall base, so not down low like this. And it was a replica of an earlier sculpture of Hercules that had been made sort of maybe 300 or so, 400 or so years before. So the Romans too were engaged in making copies, but they made them very differently. They had the technology to make plaster casts, we know, because we found bits of plaster cast. But we found them in sculptural workshops, rather than in people's houses. 
So it looks as if plaster casts were used as a means of disseminating um, kind of well-loved originals around sculpture workshops around the ancient world where they could then be turned into multiple versions by the sculptors. The sculptors were doing that by using calipers to measure, so they weren't making exact copies. And in fact, the Farnese Hercules is a really nice example of that because the original, which is now lost, we're never ever going to find it again, um, was probably not quite this big. And one of the things that Roman sculpture buyers liked to do when they invested in these kind of free copies was they liked to kind of inject a little bit of play. So we find out absolutely huge Hercules like this one, and then we find little bitty bitty ones that kind of are like sort of garden gnomes or tabletop decorations. And of course that plays out really nicely for a figure who is kind of um, like the hero par excellence and is all about his body, really. So uh, Roman copying was very flexible. Now the traditional way of understanding these processes of copying, particularly since we don't have the originals, is that maybe sometimes they're just a little bit subpar. And maybe that's because the Romans didn't quite know um, what, they were, what they were buying, essentially. Maybe they were sort of bad connoisseurs. And that's very much been a traditional way of sort of understanding and interpreting classical art history in terms of a kind of rise and fall narrative of kind of improvement, 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 archaic to classical, all Hellenistic starts to go down, Roman's all bad, really bad. Um, but more recently, people have tried to reassess Roman copying and this kind of copying culture, these free copies that we see in the ancient world, and try to think of them a little bit more in terms of how every act of copying is a kind of process of the creation of meaning. And I hope you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit invested in this interpretation given that I curate an entire gallery of copies. <laughs> feel it, I really feel it. Uh, so if you think about it, every time a copy is made it's always different to its original. It might be that the material changes, so very often the Romans would switch from um, a bronze original to a marble copy or a different material change. In fact, copying very often actually is a transfer of materiality. Um, but also that, that claim of size is also one way of introducing change and changing the way that we engage with the sculpture and the types of meanings that it might carry. And of course, little tiny tweaks in either the style or the pose, all of these can actually have very big impacts on the way that we understand a copy or the way that we engage with it. And then there's the bigger sort of picture of context of display. So the fun easy Hercules here, we probably engage with him quite differently than we might if he was still in the Fitzroy Museum. But simultaneously, we engage with him very differently than we would if we were viewing him in his beautiful sculpture gallery on Thames. Um, but also, we probably engage, Roman audiences would have engaged with one of their free copies very differently if they viewed it in, say, a house rather than a garden. So each of these kind of processes of, de of decision making, some of which are done by the patron, the owner, some of which are done by the sculptor, introduce um, new meanings into the sculpture. So that every single replica, although it's linked to its, its original by a kind of invisible, indelible line, you can't really have a copy if you don't recognise it as a copy in a sense, does it lose its meaning and value? at the same time is an independent object with its own history and its own biography and its own viewers and its own sort of meaning, as it were. Does that make sense? So I think that's enough about the Farnese Hercules. And now what we're going to do is go and look at the ways in which copying plays out in some of the rest of our objects from the ancient world. So we're here now in the Roman portraits. I want to talk about the portraits in terms of how they function as copies. So I don't know how much you know about how portraits were made in the Roman world, how the emperor sort of had control of his image. We're very used to thinking about the production of the imperial image in terms of propaganda, which would mean that the images were made in the center and then disseminated throughout the empire. But in fact, actually, that would be a much more top-down model 
than we see. Instead, we understand portrait dissemination through a process of a much more kind of bottom-up process. So Augustus would have had his portrait carved uh, and presumably he had the okay of whether it was the one that he wanted because it was going to be his official portrait. But he didn't then have lots of portraits made up of himself and then send them out. Instead, that official portrait type was probably sent out to sculptural workshops again, which would have been based throughout the empire. And individual towns or cities might make the decision to erect a statue of Augustus, probably, you know, thinking to themselves, oh, you know what our, What would really make our agora? Oh, portrait of, of the emperor. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent idea, that. Um, and, you know, maybe might please the emperor too at the same time. So, yay, good times. But what that means is that portraits were being made in lots of different styles because each sculptural workshop, the sculptors there probably would have been trained in local techniques and styles. And that can make identifying portraits a little bit tricky. Um, so what you see here are a series of portraits of Augustus and probably on face value they do look really similar. So if we look at the facial features, you know this one is an Augustus, that one's an Augustus, we've got an Augustus there, he's an Augustus, there's another one behind me as well. Um, and we probably do look at these and feel quite confident that we could tell just from looking at the faces that they're all the same chap. Although I'm standing here and thinking, actually I can see that this guy's got a slightly different nose and he also has slightly, um, in some ways more lines, but in some ways this guy's got a more furrowed brow and this guy's definitely not got a furrowed brow and this guy's pretty perfect looking. No wrinkles, he's wrinkle free. He's been using his face cream and SPF every day. Um, but in fact, because of all of these kind of regional variations, sometimes relying on the facial features isn't actually the most reliable way. And it's not what scholars always use to identify portraits. In fact, scholars use a technique called counting locks. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, there are people out there who have staked their entire careers on this. So um, what you need to do to identify your portrait of Augustus, you're looking for particular locks of hair. And if we were doing it properly, we'd be looking all over the head, but we can get away with just doing the ones at the front. So what you're looking for is one lock that curls around like this in the middle of the forehead, and then two or three that curl back towards it. So you can see he's got them. This guy here's got them too. This chap's got them as well. He's a nice example of it. And, I mean, it sounds like absolute madness, doesn't it? I'm genuinely telling you that scholars don't bother looking at facial features to identify a portrait. They look at the hair. What craziness is this? But there is logic behind it. So remember I said all those regional sculptors working in their individual styles? What that can mean is that actually you can get quite different facial features. So this guy's been applying all of his SPF and he looks terribly smooth. Um, and wrinkle free, whereas this guy's got a really deep furrow on his brow. And this guy has a bit of a bump on the end of his nose, etc. etc. This guy's got an even slimmer nose. He's had a nose job. The way that the thinking goes is that actually sculpting hair is pretty hard. It's really difficult because hair is kind of wild, as Disney has taught us, for instance, um, when they did Tangled and they had to come up with a whole algorithm just to do the hair and make it move naturally. That's an aside. Um, <laughs> but hair, that, means that, that also means that probably where a sculptor is working on replicating uh, the prototype for the portrait, they're much more likely to stay true to the layout of the locks, which gives some kind of order um, to the hair, than they are perhaps to replicate the style of the prototype. So for instance, this guy's got a lovely bushy head of hair, um, lots of mousse or volumizer in that one, and this chap's hair is much flatter. That's quite different. This guy's got a kind of little quiff, but the other, other locks across the head are a little bit less defined. And his hair is really neat and tidy. But the locks are the same. 
Now that, and what that means is that scholars then are able to build up what's called a corpus of portraits. So different scholars might argue over what belongs in the corpus, but the body, the central body, usually stays the same. So they'll argue over ones on the edges of one person will say, yes, I think that is an Augustus. Another person will say, oh, it's probably not an Augustus. I don't agree. Uh, but but the, the process of counting locks, I suppose, gives a kind of strategy, something to hold on to, to identify the portrait types. Now, it's clearly not a flawless plan, because if, for instance, I were to get my hair cut like Victoria Beckham, it is enormously unlikely that you, viewing me now, would think, oh my gosh, it's Victoria Beckham. And you see, that's the thing about hairstyles. Other people can have them too. And just like celebrities today, the emperor and the empress would set sort of the fashions for everyone to follow. So we might find that people wanting to kind of aspire upwards would adopt a hairstyle used by the emperor. But we also find that, for instance, Augustus himself uses his hairstyle in pretty clever ways. So this portrait up here doesn't look like the other portraits of Augustus. But if we look closely at the hair, we'll see those same locks of hair. It would be difficult to believe that this is Augustus representing himself as ruler because he wasn't a child when he became emperor. So either we've got a really young portrait of Augustus here as Octavian, or more likely what we're seeing is the kind of visual construction of a dynasty. So Augustus, Basically, he was really unlucky. He kept adopting lots of heirs, and unfortunately, they kept dying on him when they were very young. And so this particular portrait has been um, identified as his grandson, one of those heirs, who met a sad and untimely end before he could see through um, his heirdom, as it were. But by, by giving him the same hairstyle, what that does is plug this portrait into Augustus's imagery. So it creates this visual link that viewers can see to understand that there's a bloodline or a family line there, whether it's a constructed one because Augustus could also adopt heirs that he wasn't related to, or whether it is one by blood. So we see actually a very dynamic use of these hairstyles as well. But at their root, these hairstyles are functioning this way, ultimately, because making portraits is a process of replication and then variation. So whether it's replication of the prototype or whether it's other people copying the hairstyle or um, Augustus and the imperial family finding mileage in continuing to use that hairstyle to create dynastic imagery, it's, it's this kind of process of sculptural copying that sits at the root of it. Okay, so what we've stopped here to look at is this statue of Aphrodite or Venus. You can tell she's Venus or Aphrodite, not only because she's naked, um, but also because she has this little dolphin and a cherub at her leg. Um, to show that you know, she was born from the waves themselves, from the sea. Now, normally what I would do at this point is I would ask you to tell me what she looks like, to describe what she looks like, but unfortunately you're not here. So I'm going to have to do it all on my own, really. So she's standing naked and if I were to ask you to, you, to tell me what types of words you would use to describe her pose and how she's holding herself, um, you would probably tell me straight away that she's covering herself up. And so I would ask you, does she know that we're here looking at her? And you'd probably say yes. Yes, she really does, because those hands are very deliberately placed, as if she knows that she's naked and she's really feeling it and she can tell that we're looking at her, even though she's not looking at us because she's turned her head away. Um, and if I were then to ask you, how do we think she's feeling? about this. We might say she looks quite vulnerable and the reason for that is the way that her body is kind of hunching over as if she's trying to make herself small, she's creating what we might call a closed posture. Um, or we might say she looks kind of ashamed and in fact it's all it's sculptures like this that sometimes mean that people say that 
the very sort of beginning of female shame in the body begins in the ancient world, this sense that there is something to hide about the naked female body. Now it seems to me that while that's in some ways a really tempting argument, it's also a very heavy weight for what are some very slim shoulders to bear here. But it's certainly true that this is a sculpture that, through its pose and the way that it engages us as viewers, sets up a particular relationship between us and Venus or Aphrodite here. And in fact, actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that, because this sculpture too is, it belongs in that group of, of Roman copying culture um, of, of this kind of free copying that we see. Remember when at the beginning I talked about kind of little variations in pose or sometimes big variations in pose. Now this particular statue, in order to understand it, we need to walk a little bit further down the gallery and see the sculpture, the version of Aphrodite that it's based on. And then we can understand more what the what little tiny tweaks in the pose might do to change the way that we engage with and understand a sculpture and also the meaning that the same figure can carry into similar but different sculptures or copies. Okay so we've moved down the gallery now and we're looking at another naked Aphrodite and in many ways the one that we just looked at with the hands covering herself is in fact a variation on this one. This is the Aphrodite of Cnidus. She was famous for being the first ever female nude. Of course she wasn't the first female nude, of course there had been naked women drawn and painted and sculpted before, of course there had. Um, but she was very special in lots of ways and the impact that she has had on later art is felt in, in fact, the sculpture that we just looked at because it's a fine example of the, of the freedom of this copying culture that we find in Rome. The Aphrodite of Canidos dates to the sort of end of the classical period, um, around about the 3rd century BCE. The original is now lost, we only know it through copies and variations, like the one we just looked at. And the original was something called a cult statue. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that term before, but a cult statue is the statue of the god or the goddess in their temple. It's the statue that the temple houses. In many ways, the temple sort of feels like one big frame for that statue. And it's where, for instance, prayers might be directed. Although temples are very different places of worship than churches, for instance. In a church, everyone goes in together to worship. In a temple, everyone stays outside because that's where the sacrifice happens because you probably don't want to drive cows up your beautiful marble temple steps because that will, that will not end well. So the cult statue stands inside the temple or in the sort of cultic space. And it is, for all intents and purposes, it is the goddess, she is. Aphrodite. She is the very manifestation of the divine on earth. Of course, Greek and Roman audiences also weren't stupid. They knew it was just a statue. So, on the other hand, it's like two extremes. So, on the one hand, the statue simultaneously both is the manifestation of the deity and is just a statue. And then somewhere in the middle, there's also this kind of thinking of cult statues as being kind of like vessels. So, you know, the gods, they're busy. They've got a lot of different cults dedicated to them across the Greek and Roman world. So they can't be in all of them at once. But, you know, they might flip down sometimes to occupy their statue, preferably when you're praying to it. You know, that would be good if they could witness your prayer. But they won't be there all the time. It's just a vessel. They can come in and out. So there is this kind of complex way of thinking about a cult statue and its relationship to the deity. Um, and there are, and it's a way of thinking about it which maybe doesn't make much sense to us because it means holding two sort of mutually exclusive or contradictory thoughts simultaneously at once without them contradicting each other. She both is and isn't the goddess. So the Aphrodite of Cnidus was famously housed in a round temple on the island of Cnidus on a cliff. 
Uh, what I want to do now is unpack a little bit the pose of this statue, not just to bring out what matters about how the last Venus we just looked at down there, what matters about how that pose changes the way we engage with this sculpture, but also to show actually how complex relating to this particular sculpture is. That, you know, on the face of it, she maybe looks like just a woman standing there naked, but if we unpack what's happening when we view her and how we as viewers engage with her, um, then we might realise that actually there's a lot more going on here in how the sculpture constructs our relationship to the goddess herself. Okay, so I want you to imagine that she is standing in her round circular temple, which is really unusual, um, and that she's facing the door. So as you walk in, you're going to walk in facing her straight on, almost a little bit like you're viewing her now, although you might be a little bit off to the side. And if I were to ask you why she's naked, you might point to, for instance, this item here. Now, that looks a little bit like a towel. And in many ways that makes a lot of sense, but it's probably her clothing because it's her drapery, because there isn't really tailoring for women in the ancient world. So what you're looking at here is a kind of kitone or something that she would put on. And if you look down underneath the drapery, you see this, this jar here is a hydria. It's a very particular shape and a hydria carries water. So these two together give her a reason for being naked. She's having a bath. But the question then becomes, is she about to have a bath or has she just had a bath? And usually, again, you're not here, but I would ask you what you think. And different hands would go up um, for different options. Because actually, this is a pose here that is inherently ambiguous. And in some ways, I suspect it's sort of how you read it depends on where you're standing. You can read this as either she's about to pull this drapery up to cover herself and get dressed, or you can understand it as she's just getting undressed and she's about to drop it and um, have her bath. Uh, so, in many ways then, being a statue of a naked woman means having a reason for being naked, which is probably something that isn't applicable to male statues in the same way. We might look at that in a moment. But if she's naked, that raises all sorts of questions about why it is that we're seeing her naked. Um, so again, imagine you're walking into the temple, you're seeing her straight on. This time, let's think of her in the same way as we thought about the Venus down there. What is she doing and is she aware that we're looking at her? Okay. So for her, for us to feel like she's aware of us, we might expect her to look at us. But she's not looking at us, she's looking away. And she doesn't have this same sense that she is deliberately covering her body. Instead, her two hands are posed much more kind of casually than the last sculpture. And she also doesn't carry this sense that she looks particularly nervous or unhappy or vulnerable or ashamed because she's not crouching, she's not got those shoulders raised up to her ears, she's not, she's not covering herself up, she's not pulling herself into a smaller shape. Instead, she's pretty relaxed. She looks pretty confident in letting it all hang out. Now there's a lot at stake here, because we might ask, well, what happens when you see a goddess naked? And the short answer is bad, bad, bad things. So I want you to think of Actaeon then. Um, Actaeon, who is out hunting, out hunting with his hounds, and he comes across the virgin goddess Artemis, and she's bathing in the woods. He doesn't know she's there, he doesn't mean to see her naked, but she is so angry at his violation of her that she turns him into a stag, and he is torn apart by his own hunting hounds. That is a horrible story, it's hideous! Um, and then there's Anchises. So Anchises and Aphrodite herself, they fall in love and they have a night of wonderful passion. And at the end of it, Aphrodite's like, you're not, you're not going to tell anyone about this, are you? It's just, just between you and me, right? And Anchises, he says, oh yeah, no, don't, don't you worry. Next night in the pub, 
off he goes telling all of his mates. But that obviously that is my own telling of the story. If anyone is writing their A levels or anything, don't don't write that as your version. Um, but so he tells his friends, and Aphrodite is so angry that she blinds him so that he won't see her or any other lady naked ever again. Um, so bad things. So it is a risk to see Aphrodite here naked. There is this frisson of danger seeing her naked. But there's also the potential for opportunity. Because if, when we look at her, we think she doesn't know as we come into the temple that we're looking at her, there's this voyeuristic element to the way that we're engaging with her. And one of the reasons that it feels like she doesn't know that we're looking at her is because she's looking over there. There's this opportunity for us. What we could do is step away from where we are as we've come into the temple, walk over there, meet her gaze, and be the person that she's stripping naked for, or that she's getting dressed afterwards. And if we do that, I tell you what, this hand here that looks like it's kind of potentially casually covering her up, maybe covering her up at all. And of course, this is also um, a particularly appealing way of understanding this sculpture, given that Aphrodite is the closest thing to the personification of sex and love in the ancient world that we're probably going to find. In fact, the Greek for sex is ta aphrodisia, the things of Aphrodite. Um, and so in that respect, having these two viewing, viewing positions and being given the opportunity to imagine or fantasise a slightly closer relationship with Aphrodite simply by moving around the temple works in many ways to enact her very power. While simultaneously, of course, those stories about um, danger and the damage that an angry naked goddess can do give her a kind of, uh, of what empower her, her divinity, as it were. They give her that sense of her being the manifestation of the goddess that there's always this risk when you see her naked. And in fact, there were other stories that went around in the ancient world um, that sort of play off those myths and suggest that it's the stories that were told about these types of statue that really empowered them and raised them above you know, mere garden sculpture. Um, so Aphrodite, for the many centuries that she stood in her temple by the Roman period, she had become incredibly famous and she was something of a tourist destination. And we know this because people write about traveling to go and see her. So she was really famous by that point. And we have this story about a young man who fell in love with the statue and it's recounted in more than one source. He fell in love and every single day he would come and he would visit Aphrodite in her temple. And then one day he hid in the temple so that when the guards locked up the doors at night, they didn't know that he was still inside. And so overnight, he consummated his desire for her. And he left a stain as its evidence on one of her, one of her bum cheeks, a stain that couldn't be removed. Um, so he attempted to have sex with the statue. And the next morning, remember the guards, they don't know that he's there. The next morning, Aphrodite is so angry at his violation of her, that when the guards come, not knowing he's inside, they open the doors and the man, he comes barreling past them. Remember, I said this temple is on a cliff because Aphrodite is born of the waves. The waves are sacred to her. It's on a cliff. The man, he comes barreling past the guards, runs, runs past them, runs, 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 throws himself off the cliff and dies on the rocks below. Because Aphrodite, she was just as angry as Artemis was. Um, and and she, she punished him for, for his transgression. And that was just a story about the statue. But it was clearly a story that was very popular. So it's these stories and these myths that ensure that as a cult statue, Aphrodite retains her divinity and her divine power. But we're not looking at that cult statue, are we? I mean, we're looking at a plaster cast, obviously. But it's a plaster cast of a Roman copy because the original was taken to Constantinople and it was destroyed in a fire. So there is definitely no way 
that we are going to find that again it is gone. Um, and so what we see there is a process through which Aphrodite, through replicas, through free replicas that changed the size, changed the pot next to her, and in fact, actually, on with greater variation, changed the way that she was posed to transform the way that as, as a viewer you engage with her. Um, Aphrodite was moved through these copies out of her divine context, out of the temple. She stopped being a cult statue. And, you know, as you walk around this gallery, if you were here, you might be quite struck by the number of naked Aphrodites that are all around you. In fact, sometimes it feels like if you were a Roman gentleman, your garden was not complete if it did not have a naked Venus or Aphrodite in it. But when you take Aphrodite, you make a copy of her, and you take her out of her, gar out of her temple, and you put her in your garden instead. And I suppose the you here, let's be honest, is a male, aristocratic, Roman man, does she lose some of that divinity? Does she risk coming a little bit down to earth and being just a naked woman in your garden? I think she possibly does, because context has the power to transform what the sculpture means and how it's received and how audiences engage with it. So I think these two Aphrodites are really nice, actually, for thinking not only about how those little tweaks in a pose, and they are quite small tweaks, they're not massive ones, can have a huge impact on the way that you understand a sculpture, but also for thinking more broadly about processes of replication as being productive rather than just, you know, negative knockoffs, really. So we're going to look at one last sculpture, and in many ways we're going to start where we began, finish where we began, um, with a naked man, because God knows there's enough of them in this gallery. Can't swing a cat in here without hitting a naked man. Um, this statue here is Polyclitus's Dirifros. Dirifros means spear bearer, so he would have had a spear in this hand here, and we don't really know who he represented, of course, we're not looking at the original Terifiros, we're looking at a plaster cast, which is a copy of a Roman version of the original Terifiros, and the Roman version was carved in marble, and the original would have been cast out of bronze. So we're looking at several removes, essentially. And Polyclitus, he made this statue, not because he just fancied making yet another naked gentleman, um, but because he wanted to kind of embody his theory about how to make the perfect male body. And he wrote that down in a treatise called The Canon. And we've now lost The Canon. What we know about it is that it was a theory that rested on proportions. So every element of the body was proportional and self-relational. So the head, the, sorry, the body was so many heads tall. The arms were so many heads long. The hip to the knees were so many heads long, down to the smallest proportions of the body. So it was all entirely self-relational, self-referential. You would think, wouldn't you, that if I were to tell you that we have multiple versions, multiple Roman copies of this lost original that Polyclitus made to show off how you can make this perfectly mathematical, proportional male body, that we could just like measure them up, right? And then we would know exactly what was in the, the lost treatise that he wrote, the canon. Um, There's probably no surprise at this point that that doesn't really work. Because in fact, when we measure up the various different versions of the Deriferous, that we have, and in fact, there are lots of them. This was probably one of the most famous and beloved sculptures of the ancient world. They crop up all over the shop. Um, when we measure them up, we find they all measure up slightly differently. And what that's probably an indication of is that these Roman patrons, these Roman audiences, who were so invested in having a copy of this famous sculpture weren't in fact invested in the exact mathematical proportions 
that it embodied. Instead, this is yet more evidence of the freedom within the Roman copying culture process that you know, this use of calipers resulted in these replicas with all of their little individual tweaks and differences. Now some of those, in this case, would have very much been material-based ones. Um, so what you see here, you see this kind of prehistoric worm type thing that is sort of suckering into his thigh, into his leg, that wouldn't have been there in the original. And that's an additional support that is added in um, to support a marble sculpture where the original was in bronze. Sometimes people say that that means that if every time you see a support, it means that you're looking at a Roman copy. And that's probably not true because really any time you carve something out of marble, it's going to need a little bit of extra help. Now sometimes though those supports are added in in ways that sort of almost make them invisible and make them really make sense. And other times, yeah, they just look like a weird prehistoric worm like here. So when you see one that looks really ugly and out of place, maybe that is a good indication that it's a copy, but it isn't a guarantee. Now, this sculpture became really influential even in the ancient world, partly because of the type of pose that um, it holds. This is a very complicated pose here where it looks very simple. It's called contraposto. And what it involves is, it's a little bit mathematical again actually, um, it involves a series of contrasts in the muscles in the body. So this leg is his um, tense leg, okay, so all the muscles in that leg are tensed. And what that does is it makes him, tensing up one leg makes you put your weight over that hip and it makes you relax the other leg to compensate. So this leg is relaxed. In um, his torso, instead, it's the other way around. So this side is relaxed and this side is tense because, again, if you jut one hip out, your upper body is going to bend back in order to preserve your sense of balance. So your body will just do that naturally. Um, and then in his neck, it's the other way around. So that side is relaxed and that side, no, sorry, that side is tense and that side is relaxed. Now you might be looking at this pose and saying, hang on a sec, this feels a little bit familiar. And that's because if you were eagle-eyed, you might have spotted that the Aphrodite of Cnidos also stood in the same pose. But it has a very different impact on the female body than the male. So here um, in the Doriferos, he looks really bouncy. He's like a coiled spring. So he's bouncy. He could, he's standing still, but he could just get up and go at any moment. Instead, on the Aphrodite, what we saw instead was it created something that's called an S-curve. So it exaggerated the curves in the female body, ones that Aphrodite had ample of. Um, and one of the differences here is that we spent a lot of time working out why the Aphrodite was naked. And in contrast, there's absolutely zero reason for the Doryphorus to be naked. If he's got a spear, he's about to go and fight or go to war or something. There is no reason why he would go into battle naked. That is a really stupid thing to do. And of course, no one in the ancient world went into battle naked. So the Doryphoros doesn't need a reason to be resplendent in his nudity, unlike Aphrodite, for whom it was part of her kind of, um, like the narrative that was built up around her. So this pose, you would see this pose replicated throughout the gallery because it's one that becomes a kind of visual quotation mark that later statues, later sculptures very often use. But it's also one that had a really strong impact even beyond the ancient world. So you might recognise it, in fact, from the Renaissance onwards, from art from the Renaissance onwards. And it's one that, in fact, actually, we might recognise today. So women, female celebrities, are often told to stand in this pose precisely because of that S-curve. So if you think of Angela Jolie at um, the Oscars with the leg coming out of the dress, that was an exaggerated contraposto. So the pose here is really important, but it's, not, it's certainly not restricted to this statue. But it's also important to note that although this looks like what we might call a naturalistic body, this is a body that probably none of us can actually have. It doesn't really matter how hard we work out in the gym, we're probably not 
go to get this body. So, for instance, if you look here, this is called his iliac crest. Now, you will see this definition on lots of ancient sculptures. You'll also see it on, for instance, Olympic swimmers and people that go to the gym a lot. Um, it's definitely something that the human body can do. But in ancient sculpture, what we sometimes find is it goes around as an unbroken line all the way around the back. You definitely can't really do that. It doesn't matter how many times you hit the gym. And here, what he's got here is this kind of almost like fatty padding above it to exaggerate it. And it's quite unlikely that if you're working out enough that you have all this muscle definition, that you're also going to have these convenient love handles um, sitting there to, to emphasise your iliac crest. So although we do tend to think of these sculptures in terms of naturalism, they are constructions, they are more than perfect. So we definitely probably shouldn't measure ourselves up against all the naked figures in this gallery as if they have better bodies than us and we're failing, because we simply we can't look like this. So let's just bring this back around to copying, I suppose, to conclude. Um, again, if we were to look at multiple versions of the Doriferous, we'd probably see the bodies looking slightly different because there would be these variations in how different sculptors trained in different traditions were making the Doriferous look. And this is another example where we've lost the original. It doesn't matter how hard we look, we're just simply never going to find it. So we can never measure these up um, as lacking or, or anything against it. But they do, the Doriferos is really a good evidence of the sheer complexity of Roman copying culture. And in fact, I think my favourite fact about it is that the Romans, Roman audiences, Roman patrons, invested not only in fully embodied replicas of the Doriferos, but we also find him cut down to a portrait head, which feels particularly strange given that we don't know if he ever represented a particular figure, whether a real person or more likely a mythological one. So we've got Roman buyers putting up in their gardens portraits which are copies of a random Greek statue and yet remain instantly recognisable, so much so that we can instantly recognise them today. So Roman copying then, it might not have rested on the kind of foundations of exactitude that plaster casts do, but it was, it was a culture, a culture of complexity and of the sheer variety of context and audience engagement. Um, so what we've done today is walk through our cast gallery here in Cambridge and pick out just a few sculptures, because I like to do just a couple, not too many, um, to think about the sheer complexity of copying. Copying, whether it's in Victorian households, lovely big houses on the Thames or elsewhere, or whether it's the free copying that we see in the ancient world isn't a one-size-fits-all, but it is also a complex process that involves engaging visitors in very uh, engaging viewers in very complicated ways because viewers nearly always need to keep in mind the relationship between both the copy and its original even if they can't see the original um, and the copy itself can transform not only the way that viewers interact with it but also perhaps with the distant original